I'm going to go out on a limb and say maybe having three MVPs at the top of the lineup might be a good thing. Let's get locked on Dodgers. You are locked on Dodgers, your daily Los Angeles Dodgers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, Dodger fans, this is Locked On Dodgers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thanks to our everydayers for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every weekday morning. Remember, this show is free and available on all podcast platforms and on YouTube simply by searching for Locked On Dodgers. And please subscribe wherever you're watching or listening right now. If this is your first time with us, I am Jeff Snyder. That guy next to me is Vince Samperio, my co-host. Vince and I are both lifelong Dodger fans, just like a lot of you. We've also both spent time covering the Dodgers in the press box and the locker room. So we're not quite insiders, but we bring you the smart fans perspective on our boys in blue every weekday morning. And Vince, it's now officially, officially, officially baseball season. Every team that didn't uh, wimp out and decide not to play in the rain has now played some baseball games. I think there were a couple rainouts, but uh, opening day happened. The Dodgers are now two and one. They beat the Cardinals on domestic opening day, seven to one. And uh, for me, the big takeaway was through two times through the lineup. Uh, the big three at the top were four for six with five runs scored, and it would have been six runs scored if not for a base running error by Shohei Otani. Um, I, I feel like having three of the best hitters in baseball at the top of your lineup is probably a decent recipe for a good offense. Yeah, there's uh, when you almost got the the back to back to back in in game one, uh, so you, you you almost got that there. But yeah, I, uh, to go against the the lowly Midwestern farmers uh, that are the St. Louis Cardinals and Miles Mikolas eh, to go against guys that are making a lot of money, I guess, you know, compared to them. Um, it worked out and, and it worked out exactly how we thought it would. And, and the good part about like the game yesterday was that it worked out with the top of the order, but also the bottom of the order contributed. Max Muncy had an RBI single, you know, James Allen brought in a run. Oscar got a double and scored in between all his strikeouts. So it was an exact way of how the Dodger offense should work. Yeah, the Miles Michaelis uh, project didn't work exactly the way I said. I think I said seven runs in three and a third. It was only five runs in four and a third, but uh, still knocked him out early. And yeah, uh, the Dodgers made Michaelis pay. Uh, I don't know if they were thinking about his comments at all. Uh, I heard David Vasse say after the game that Several guys on the team did mention that Michaelis is a notorious trash talker uh, on days when he's not starting, just in the dugout and stuff. So it did seem like the Dodgers were maybe a little bit uh, excited and happy to knock him around a little bit. Dave Roberts made kind of the same point that I made on this show that uh, seems like uh, a team spending a lot of money should be something that the players should be in favor of, uh, members of the players' union. Uh, so Roberts was as bemused by it as, as I was, but yeah, I mean, the fact is Miles Michaelis is a decent pitcher, but uh, he wasn't any match for the Dodgers lineup. And, and even though like the first couple times, through the lineup, I think against Michaelis, the bottom of the lineup didn't do much at all. Um, but then they got to the, the bullpen later Outman had two hits. One of them was a accidental infield single, but then he had an RBI single. Like you said, Muncie had a sack fly and an RBI hit. Uh, and, and yeah, all in all, you know, when you're getting five runs scored in the first three innings by the top of your lineup, you don't actually need the bottom of the lineup to do that much. Uh, but you know, so anything you get from them is, is kind of a bonus. And, and like I said, th this is how you would imagine the offense is going to be successful for the most part. Those top three guys are, should do the bulk of the run producing, with you know Will Smith and Max Muncie kind of in that next tier, then everybody else kind of in in the tier after that. So it it was fun, you know. It was a uh, a great day to be at Dodger Stadium, a great day to you know catch a ball game, and uh, we both were able to do that. So that was fun. Yeah, we got to see each other. Uh, it was it was a lot of fun. You mentioned the Dodgers almost had the back to back to back homers that I predicted is going to happen a couple times this season. Uh, Mookie homered on the first pitch of the inning. And then I think Freddie's homer came on the first pitch he saw in the at-bat in between Otani walked, but on the three and O pitch, he got a pitch right down the middle and took a mighty hack. He swung and missed, but uh, 
you know, that, that pitch is going to turn into a homer <laughs> on that swing uh, at least some of the time. And so, you know, it would have been nice to get that back to back to back, get one of them out of the way for that prediction. Uh, but, you know, it can't expect everything on opening day. Otani had a double that could have been an RBI triple uh, in the first inning. Uh, he, Dino Abel held Mookie up at third. I think Mookie would have scored pretty easily, probably. It makes sense with nobody out and Freddie and Smith coming up to, to hold him. But unfortunately, Otani was thinking three and didn't see Abel hold Mookie up. Uh, I, I, it's pretty clearly on Otani, the base running error. Uh, you you have to be aware that the guy didn't go, but it's also kind of understandable why he thought Mookie would have gone because uh, Otani's thinking, I've got a stand-up triple here, so of course the guy on first base is going to score on my triple. Uh, he forgets, I guess, maybe that, that Mookie isn't as fast as him, uh, but also, you know, I, I think it's a natural place. First inning, nobody out to be conservative with your, your third base coaching. So I wasn't see, surprised to see Ebo hold him up, even though, I was a little bummed because I do think he would have scored easily. Yeah, one, Dino Ebo probably listens to this podcast because he wanted Freddie to rack up the RBIs because I said that Freddie's going to lead the league in RBIs. So, you know, good on him. And two, I think I saw a tweet about Otani. So used to having to carry the team that he was thinking triple out of the out of the box and didn't realize, like, hey, I have guys behind me that can, you know, do the damage too. So, uh, you know, it, it, it happens. It was uh, – you know, it was it kind of took away the fun of Otani's first Dodger hit. Well, not first Dodger hit, but first Dodger Stadium hit. Uh, just because, you know, you get the weird awkwardness of both of them standing on the base and you know, whatever the case is. But again, it, it didn't end up mattering. And uh, as long as they're hitting uh, and they're not making these types of issues or, or these types of mistakes all the time, then it's fine. Yeah, it's a little bit bad timing because Otani did also have a base running blunder in the Korea series. And so they've played three games and he has two bad base running mistakes. But overall, Otani is a pretty good base runner. And so I'm not too concerned about it. I think it's probably just a little bit being overeager and wanting to have that big moment in his first Dodger Stadium at bat. And uh, everything will be fine there. Uh, he also, Otani had two more hits, I think. Uh including one that was 113 miles an hour off the bat. Uh, like off the bat, it looked like, I mean, it looked like a hard yeah, ground. Two hits total. Oh, two. Okay. That's right. Um, oh, we had a walk in there. That's what I was thinking of before Freeman's home run. Uh, but yeah, the other hit was 113 miles an hour off the bat. Just a ground ball up the middle, but you could tell like, well, that thing got through quickly and looked up at the board. Yeah. 113 miles an hour. I'll say that was a uh, pretty decent. The Dodgers don't, uh, hit the ball 113 miles an hour very often. Uh, I think I saw something that it would have been the hardest hit ball by a Dodger last year, something like that. Uh, so, yeah, uh, if Otani's hitting the ball hard and getting on base, that's a, a pretty good spark plug, especially with Mookie and, and Freddie surrounding him. Uh, like I said, you know, why don't they make the whole plan out of the black box? Why don't they make the whole lineup out of former MVPs? Because that seems to be seems to be a good approach. Yeah, and then you know just the. Uh the spectacle of opening day, which, you know, we've come to know that it's great. And the Dodgers tried to look something a little bit different this year. They had the guys walk in on the blue carpet from the center field. Uh, I know Tony, I think after the game said that it was a long walk, uh, but that he appreciated, you know, all the, the decorum and everything else that went on. And, you know, it was fun. I do think it looked a little awkward, just, just like the family at the beginning and then kind of nothing for a while. would have been cool if they like filled it in with some fans maybe. But I know why they couldn't do that, but uh, it would have looked cooler that way. I think. Yeah, or figure out a way to make it shorter, have them come in from the left field bullpen instead of from center field or something, you know, so it's a little bit shorter of a walk, uh, you know, or, you know, my, my wife texted me. She's like, they're, they're athletes. Why aren't they running? And I don't know. It's supposed to be like a red carpet thing. So. Uh, you know, it was, so there was walking and a little bit of jogging, but yeah, it, it was, a but it was fun. And Brian Cranston did a good job of announcing, announcing the players, uh, the starting lineup all in all the flyover was awesome that my wife's cousin was part of, uh, my boys and I hiked up to the top deck to watch the flyover. That was cool. Uh, yeah, all in all, it was, a, it was a cool opening uh, opening day ceremony. Oh, and Adrian Beltre threw out the first pitch. That was a surprise. And I was Pleasantly surprised at how excited Dodger fans were to see him. Really? Just, I, I mean, because it's been 20 years since he played for him, you know, and like I know he was, he, he 
I know people liked him, but it was like it was louder than I expected it to be for a guy who hadn't who didn't play for them for super long and hasn't played for him in 20 years. Yeah, you either grew up watching him and brought your kids to the game, or you just grew up watching him and you're at the game. I feel like it's hard to, unless you're like a younger crowd, you're going to be connected. But opening day, a little bit higher prices, and you might have the right crowd for it. Yeah, maybe it's because I'm older. And so I was, you know, when, when Beltray was playing for the Dodgers, I was in college and away from California. So I wasn't actually getting to watch many games on TV. And so maybe I just don't have the same connection that a lot of people do just because at that time in my life was the time I've probably watched the least Dodger baseball. So maybe that, that was it. Sense. Yeah. Uh, but the Dodgers also pitched in this game, nine whole innings, uh, with just two pitchers, we're going to come back in a minute. We're going to talk about Tyler Glasnow and Ryan Yarbrough locking down this game, uh, just the two of them. So thanks for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen, and please keep it Locked On Dodgers. This episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Say goodbye to busted brackets because FanDuel lets you bet on every game of the tourney. Whether you're betting on a big upset or a one seed, it's time to go dancing on America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets if your first $5 bet wins. That's $200. Bucks. You don't have to make it a, a tough bet. Just pick somebody you're sure is going to win, put 5 bucks on it, and when you're right, you get $200 bucks in bonus bets to use on point spreads, money lines. You can even pick who's going to win it all. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and bet on college hoops until they cut down the nets. Here we're back. I want to thank you for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every weekday morning, especially our everydayers. You can become an everydayer by watching and listening every weekday morning. Met quite a few everydayers at the game on, on Thursday. That was a lot of fun. Uh, you can also become a Locked On Dodgers insider by going to joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Dodgers. And you can check out Locked On Sports Today and Locked On Sports Los Angeles, the two 24-7 streaming channels over on YouTube from the Locked On Podcast Network. Also, remember, you can catch every Dodger game uh, the Dodger broadcast on Sirius XM uh, or the SXM app. It's a lot of fun. I actually turned on the post game show on Sirius XM in my car as I was driving out of Dodger Stadium. And uh, it was weird. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, Vince, but uh, I'm listening to the radio and then a commercial came on. And my first thought was, that guy sounds like me. And then I realized it was me. It was a commercial for this podcast uh, in the middle of the Dodgers post game show with me talking. And uh, I, I had forgotten I recorded that commercial. So uh, check out Sirius XM and the SXM app uh, to listen to every Dodger game. And with that said, uh, Tyler Glasnow looked really good. After a little bit of a rough start in Korea, he pitched uh, six strong innings against the Cardinals, allowed just one run on a solo homer to Paul Goldschmidt. In all, Ryan Yarbrough came in and pitched the, the last three innings and Paul Goldschmidt was the only Cardinal to get a hit. He had three hits and the rest of their team combined to go for 27, at least for now. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, Victor Victor Scott the second ends up with a hit eventually after a, an appeal. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if the error on Mookie Betts gets turned into a hit. But either way, whether it's three or four hits, uh, those two guys really shut things down for the Dodgers on the mound. Yeah, and for Glass now, you know, the the ish not the issue, but one of the issues he has is you know, can get a little bit wild at times. I've had a little bit of issue in Korea, but a lot of pitchers had those same like similar issues in Korea. So maybe we chalk it up to that because he was super efficient. 81 pitches, six innings, 81 pitches, on just the one walk, you know, struck out five and, and like like you mentioned, not did give up one home run, but just two hits total. And then, you know, you got Ryan Yarbrough cleaning it up after that. So for what we expect out of Glasnow and kind of what we think he's going to do for the Dodgers this year, today is probably a little bit more of what we expect than, you know, anything else. Yeah. And, you know, in, in our bold predictions the other day, I predicted that a lot of Dodgers would get saves. Maybe my bold prediction should have been that the Dodgers are going to have like 25 three-inning saves this year because they do have – multiple long relievers. They have Yarbrough and Kyle Hurt and uh, Michael Grove who are all capable of going three innings. And I imagine they're going to win a lot of games by several runs like this where they will have the opportunity to just, you know, the Dodgers are up by six runs. Just say, hey, Yarbrough come in and just close it down even if you give up a run or two, you know, pitch the last three innings. And that does save the bullpen a lot because now the Dodgers who don't have a day off for a little while, didn't have to use any relievers other than Yarbrough in this game. And so their entire bullpen 
is fresh. There's there's a lot of value in that, especially with three different guys who can do that. They're going to have the opportunity to, you know, every few games, hopefully have a, a game where none of the short relievers have to pitch at all. Yeah, and it, it's I wouldn't I don't know if a risk, you know, but we haven't seen some of these guys throw back to back. So you do need to win some games like this in order for it to work. Not every team can can really roll out something like this now as time goes on you know grove and hurt will probably throw some back to backs or you know two out of threes three out of fours uh just out of necessity because you know they're not always going to win by this score you or they could but uh, you know realistically they're going to hit some spurts where they don't and that's kind of where you know i want to see what happens there because it work when it does work it works out perfectly like today you know one reliever three innings that's all you needed Boom. Okay. Next game, your your whole bullpen's fresh. But you know what happens if the next two games are are close games and the starters don't go as deep, and you know you need to use multiple arms. And then Grove, you know, as we saw, wasn't as effective in the second inning. Hurt wasn't as as effective in the second inning. That could have been just a one time thing. That could be something moving forward. That's something we're gonna learn as this you know thing goes on. And and in a seven to one game, it doesn't matter so much or, you know, five, one, six, one. I don't remember what it was when the came in specifically, but it's not going to matter too much. But, you know, when it's uh, maybe a five, two game and you're trying to get by with these guys when multiple innings because you do need to save some of your levers, that's where I'm interested to see how this is going to go. Yeah. I did see one person on social media complaining that Dave Roberts pulled glass now after six innings. He's only 80 pitches, you know, uh, important to remember first start of the season. Yeah, I haven't learned by now. I don't really know when you're going to Yeah. Lie. Yeah. I think people just like to be angry about something. Um, it, it was kind of fun sitting where I was sitting because I was near the Dodgers family section. So seeing Tyler Glasnow's family sitting down in the front row uh, of that family section. Teoscar Hernandez had a big rooting section. I counted at least 13 people and at least five of them had their phones out recording his first at bat with the Dodgers. So, uh, it was it was fun to see that Ellen Kershaw was there with her kids. Uh, obviously, a lot of families were there. Uh, I, I don't recognize all of the the wives and girlfriends uh, necessarily, but uh, it, it's it's fun to see the families there and, and fun to sit in that area and just kind of watch them. Uh, the excitement there for these guys, especially Glasnow and T. Oscar, their first games with the Dodgers. Uh, obviously. Uh, uh, an exciting time for them. Glasnow being a local boy, I feel like Tyler Glasnow being f- from Santa Clarita, Santa Clarita is quickly becoming uh, similar to Clayton Kershaw and Matthew Stafford played little league together. Like it's a, uh, it gets mentioned a lot, you know. Yeah, well, I mean, it, we hear about it. You know, that's why Arenado like always kind of gets linked to the Dodgers because he's from here and, you know, different guys in, in the past have kind of been linked to it. So, yeah, it's one of those where it's funny because, you know, L.A., like people that live in like South, Southern L.A., East L.A., uh, you know, normally don't really claim the Valley as L.A. I think that, you know, that might spark some some uh, comments, but I'm just saying that's what I have the general tone I usually get. So, when, you know, to me, it's fun. It's kind of like Paul George. I think Paul George was from Palmdale when he came to the Clippers and, you know, coming back home and everything else. And people are like, oh, that's not really L.A., but, you know, technically it might be, but not necessarily. And if, it kind of feels like that where it's like, all right, he he's not that close to Dodger Stadium. Yeah, well, it could be worse. I remember last year, the whichever two Reds young players are from Southern California – the Reds were playing in San Francisco, and I saw a headline refer to it as a homecoming for the California boys. It's like, yeah, I don't know that the Bay Area is uh, really a homecoming for for two guys from L.A. or Orange County. Uh, yeah, but it's a, it is fun to see a guy who grew up rooting for the Dodgers have the chance to start an opening day at Dodger Stadium. I think Glasnow said he had never actually been to an opening day at Dodger Stadium and, until today. So that that was a lot of fun. Obviously, exciting time for him and his family. Uh, all in all, it was just like op- opening day is always fun. The home opener is always a good time. There's always something special going on before the game and everything. But this one, just with how big the offseason was, how highly anticipated this opening day was, you couldn't have asked for a much better script than Glasnow dominating on the mound and and the big three dominating at the plate. 
So no complaints there. Uh, we are going to come back in a minute. We're going to talk about uh, some injury news that we got from Dave Roberts before the game, talk about how that could impact the team going forward, and maybe talk a little bit more about opening day. So thanks again for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen, and please continue to keep it Locked On Dodgers. Hey, we're back. Thank you again for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen. Please remember to become an everydayer by watching and listening every weekday morning. If you're already an everydayer, thank you. You're our favorite. Uh, you can also become a Locked On Dodgers insider by going to joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Dodgers. It's a text message-based service. You can get our thoughts on news and, and rumors as they happen. Uh, you can text us back and forth one-on-one. -on -one. It's a lot of fun, so check that out. It's just a few bucks a month with a free 14-day trial. Be sure to check out Locked On Sports Today and Locked On Sports Los Angeles, the two 24-7 streaming channels over on YouTube from the Locked On Podcast, Podcast Network. And when you can't watch the Dodger game on TV, be sure to check it out on SiriusXM or the SXM app. Uh, you can get the, the hometown broadcast there anytime you want. Uh, for example, Friday night's game is an Apple TV exclusive. And so if you don't have Apple TV Plus or whatever it is, you can listen to the game uh, on SiriusXM or the SXM app. So check that out. Uh, so before the game, Vince or Dave, Dave Roberts, you're, you're Vince. Dave Roberts is Dodgers manager, not you. Uh, Dave Roberts had his media scrum in the dugout with the members of the media, and he gave a couple updates. He said that Blake Trinan and Bruce Dark Gratterall are both a ways away, he said. And he said that Bobby Miller, or not Bobby Miller, Walker Bueller, is likely to return uh, sooner than we might have expected. Uh, like within, we, we've been thinking May, he might be back in, in April, maybe even mid-April. Uh, and so it's tough to say how long a rehab start he'd need, but you know whatever that means, Roberts didn't put a time on it, but sooner than expected, uh, that is good news for Walker Bueller for sure. Yeah, and... You know, it's kind of interesting just based on the fact of we weren't really sure what the plan was for Walker Bueller. It seemed like it was more of the Dodgers maybe holding him back a little bit rather than, you know, Walker Bueller not being 100% ready. But now it's kind of merging the two where it feels like, okay, he does feel like he's ready or he's ready to go on the Dodgers aren't going to hold him back if they're saying he's going to be ready earlier than we thought. So that's exciting. You know, it's one of those things where it just depends what Bueller comes out of this. And, and if it is a, a Bueller with diminished velocity in terms of the fastball, you know, how's everything going to play off of that? But we'll worry about that when we get there and, and let's just get him here and see what he can do. And, you know, he's going to go make some rehab starts, I would imagine. And, and, you know, could be ready in maybe two weeks, three weeks now where we were talking maybe into May, you know, maybe it's, it's before May now. And that, and that's exciting. And, you know, what we'll, we'll, you know, as we talked about, like everything kind of figures itself out. We'll see what happens in the rotation. Like, are they going to bring them back? And then, you know, Stone gets the move down, but Stone will kind of be that first guy up the rest, you know, until the next they need somebody or whatever the case is. You know, there's a lot of bridges to cross once we get there, but it's exciting to get Walker Bueller back. Yeah, for sure. The bad news in all of that is that Gratterall and Trinan are both a ways away from coming back. Gratterall, we've never really gotten total clarity on what the injury is, uh, but the fact that it is <laughs> not cleared up yet and not seemingly very close to being cleared up is a little bit concerning, especially with Gratterall's history of arm issues that have kind of lingered longer than we would have hoped. Trinan, we know exactly what his injury was. He got hit in the chest by a line drive, it had a bruised lung, and I've never had a bruised lung, so maybe this is normal recovery time. I kind of assumed since they they originally didn't di didn't even immediately rule him out for going to Korea, and so I just kind of assumed okay, it's going to be a, a relatively short term thing. But now it seems like uh, maybe a bruised lung takes longer to heal than than I might have thought. Yeah, I mean, we I would imagine you know it felt kind of weird that you know we talked about it how. If you bruise your lung, I don't think you should go on a long flight, but you know, they know better than we do. And, and now it's probably just the pain. Like I would imagine he has pain right here, wherever he got hit and that hurts and you can't really pitch comfortably with that. And there's no reason to rush it if you don't need to, especially right now. So I'd imagine it's 
probably a pain tolerance thing. And then after that pain subsides and he has to build his arm back up, which is why it's going to take longer than we thought. That's just my speculation. That's not, you know, anything beyond that. But yeah, for Gradero, I think, you know, we got the news that his hip was bothering him at beginning after his first cactus he got in and he had a i'm assuming he compromised the way he was throwing and then his shoulder started hurting a little bit so you know you never want to hear that or shoulder soreness not shoulder pain but uh yeah for gradual it, it's i think it still goes back to kind of what i thought before like gradual's never really been a guy that started off hot and he's always kind of played his way into it as the season went on and got better as the season went on so it might just be as simple as that. Maybe he's just a guy that, eh, you know, I like to relax in the offseason. I mean, not relax in the sense of, like, not do anything, but just in the matter of, you know, sometimes some people can be that way. And when you throw 100 miles an hour, it's probably a lot easier to be like, okay, cool. Like, once I get spring training, you know, we'll, we'll get it going, ramp it up, and, and maybe it's not working out. But, again, that's just speculation. Yeah, well, as long as you're speculating, I want to play. I wonder if uh... – if Trinan maybe had an undiagnosed or undisclosed, like a, a fractured rib or something. Like it seems like if a ball hits you hard enough to bruise your lung, that it might have fractured a rib that it hit too, you know. And and that would explain, like you said, the pain tolerance. Like having a fractured rib could take a while to to get better. And whether that, you know, obviously that is just speculation. Um, but even if it's not a fractured rib, you would think that your actual body if it got hit hard enough that the lung inside the body is bruised, that the actual body would be hurting quite a bit, whether it is a bone bruise on the rib or, you know, whatever it is. Like I, like I said, I've never been, I've never had a bruised lung. I've never been hit in the chest that hard. Uh, and, and I hope never to be, uh, maybe, maybe it's a good thing that I'm unlikely to ever make the big leagues as a pitcher Vince, because, uh, I don't think I can handle getting hit in the chest by a hundred mile an hour line drive. I was about to say, when would that even have a chance to occur? Just, just pitching, I guess. And uh, yeah, I do think. Come on, your life now. That it did rule. Yeah, yeah. Now that there's three guys in the Hall of Fame younger than me, I am starting to think I'm never going to make the big leagues. And I, I think I'm okay with that at this point. How old was Well, he's obviously younger than you. How old was the guy in, in the movie The Ricky? Late I 30s? think he was like 36 when he oh, okay. tried out for the race. So he was, I'm going to be 47 in a couple months. So. Yeah, even the yeah. movie about the old man debuting, that guy was a decade younger than I am. So, well, you know, you never know. You never know. I think we do. I think, <laughs> I, I, I don't think you never know actually applies to all situations, Vince. I think in this case, we actually do know. I think there are certain things uh, you never know. It is what it is. We'll, have, we'll wait and see. Like, I think Just something apply. we say. Yeah, those yeah. are applied to all situations. Well, I'll lock this down. Even if a team calls me and wants me to play for them, I'm going to say no. So there it is. It's official now. I am officially retiring, retiring. from baseball. Yeah. Yep. Uh, but I'm going to keep doing this podcast because I like it. It was a lot of fun being at the game. I had my, my sons were counting. I think eight uh, eight everydayers come up and say hi to us. Uh, so that, that was a lot of fun. Uh, a couple that I met before, our buddy Pat Dwyer. Uh, I met his wife, who I've heard a lot about because she's from Japan. So Pat has become kind of our de facto quasi expert on all things Japan as we've been going through the last year of the Dodgers courting Otani and then signing him and all that. So it was fun to see Pat and meet his wife. Sorry, buddy Ray uh, and his friend Blythe who do Dodgers tours and they're both uh, everydayers. They do the Dodger stadium tours, awesome people. Uh, and then met, I think, you know, four or five people I had never met before. So that was, that was a lot of fun too. I love being at Dodger Stadium. I joke with my boys. I have the exact right level of fame that it doesn't affect my personal life, my everyday life at all. But a couple of people recognize me at Dodger Stadium, and that's that's perfect for me. Yeah, that works out. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, I got there a little bit later than I would have wanted to, but you know, I also have to do my day job, so that's what happens. So, uh, but if you do see me walking around at all during the season, you know, feel free to come up to me. I th- I might have something for you in my pocket if you do come up and find me. You know, never know. Yeah, I, always, I always carry some things around. And it worked out well that you happened to be there when when Ray and Blythe walked up because uh, they were excited that they got to see both of us. You, you and I, I think today was what we maybe met each other in person like 10 times now, something like that. It so, might be in the double digits. Uh, yeah. So that was exciting. Always good to see you. I guess, uh, I don't know. I think we've covered opening day. You got anything else, Vince? No. Uh, I guess, you know, the Rocky, (laughs) 
The Diamondbacks scored 14 runs and one inning against the Rockies, and it was the third inning. So, uh, yeah, I don't think the Rockies. Uh, n- not that one game defines you, but this one game might define the Rockies. Yeah, we did. Uh, I did a crossover with all the other NL West hosts recently, and we kind of talked about how the Rockies are predicted to be the worst team in baseball. And I said, I don't think that's right. I think the A's are going to be worse than the Rockies. And uh, after watching that 14 run inning, I think I want to retract everything that I said, because the Rockies appear to be really, 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 really bad. And uh, you know, our poor friends in Colorado, but you know, I'm over it. Yeah. And Nolan Arnato, I mean, at at least he's not still with the Rockies, but the Cardinals haven't done much better since he got there. Yeah. He is from one last place team to another, you know, All right, that'll do it for us for today. And I guess for this week, the Dodgers have three more against the Cardinals this weekend. Uh, I'll be at the game on Saturday. I'll be watching the other two games, of course. And then we'll be back with you Sunday night to wrap up the whole series and look forward to the series against the Giants. Uh, We want to thank all of you for watching and listening with us every weekday morning, especially our everydayers. If you're not an everydayer, it's easy to become one. Just watch or listen every weekday morning. You can also become a Locked On Dodgers insider by going to joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Dodgers. You can check out Locked On Sports Today and Locked On Sports Los Angeles, the two 24-7 streaming channels on YouTube from the Locked On Podcast Network. And you can catch every Dodger game home broadcast on Sirius XM or the SXM app. Just go into the app and search for Dodgers. You can also listen to this podcast on the SXM app by searching for Locked On Dodgers because that's the name of the podcast. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok at Locked On Dodgers. Vince is on Twitter at Vince Since 91. I'm on Twitter at Snydog. Both of our DMs are open there. You can also email us, LockedOnDodgers at gmail.com, or send us a voicemail or a text message to 323-863-LOCK-5625. We are here every weekday morning, and we hope you'll be here with us. When you get in your car or sit on your couch, tell your smart device to play podcast Locked On Dodgers. And remember, you don't have to agree. You just have to listen. We'll talk to you on Monday. Have a good one. <laughs>